So first question everyone asks is why do I care and why am I here? Um, those are, you know, obviously the most important questions. Uh, and so when you start looking at how these things are used, you start looking at number one is client uh, performance statistics. You know, one of the common questions everybody asks us when we walk into these things is, you know, how are my queries running? Uh, how, how is coherence performing from a client perspective? Uh, followed briefly by a second question, uh, which is how, what, what's, what's taking all my, uh, how, how are things performing on the server side? Are things taking a long time? Do I have serialization? And these two items are, are really not covered within coherence very well. Uh, especially in, when it comes to the context. Once a request is made out of coherence from one node, it kind of goes to the other node, falls into this big task pool, uh, executed within that task pool, and it's summed up as a task, but it doesn't really tell you what happened or how, you know, how long each individual item is taking, but you simply get an aggregate. Um, and you know, coherence just doesn't expose these items for you. So there are two things that definitely will allow you to add them. Um, one of the third items, which is sort of the original design of what uh, in, within three-fourths an item came in, which was including non-coherence MBs within the uh, within the coherence monitor. This, this feature came up as I've got a hundred or a thousand nodes in my cluster. I need to be able to see something within them, say memory or the platform it needs, or whether it's my JRocket thread or, or my WebLogic thread count. Or what's going on on these non-coherent uh, beings that actually exist? So we included that as well, and you can actually add more capabilities by adding in your third-party beings inside of it. Uh, the fourth one is sort of an extension of coherence, which is, you know, they go in, they add a new feature within coherence, uh, and, you know, they don't actually give you all the information that you want in them. They, you know, requirements are just that. They don't always put everything every individual wants. So you can also use custom MBs to expose uh, unexposed configuration or information that exists within coherence uh, that they did not include. So these are just some of them. I'm sure there are lots of other ones that you can put in, um, as well as, you know, your own application needs. So um, what are standard MBs? So the first kind of MB that you're going to write and everybody wants to write when they're doing it because it's by far the easiest, which is the standard MB. Um, and it has sort of a you know, what most people would not consider the most elegant way of doing it, but it is the way they chose, which is you create a interface that starts with your class name followed by an MB. It basically is the way it does it. So if you have a class called standard and you want to make it an MB and you add standard MP interface, you implement that interface within the, the standard class, and then at that point the MB server will actually go about pulling the methods and properties off of it, and pulling the values. So uh, simple being interface, get is methods to find attributes that allow you to update those attributes with a void return. Um, all other methods are considered operations. So the fundamentals are very simple with actually determining how to set, get, and add items. Um, one thing about coherence in beams, and most people who use coherence realize that all items are serializable. Um, standard in beams uh, are provided, they don't actually have to be serializable. Coherence under the covers will actually, you know, use as reflection to pull the in beams out of the uh, in beam server and uh, register them appropriately within the items from the reflective class. Uh, basically, there's a list of data types, you know, Boolean characters, bytes, shorts, uh, as well as uh, object names and slopes. There's one other data type that 
isn't listed there for some reason, which is the uh, tabular data item. And the tabular data item is really going to be uh, a much it is one of the more powerful items that allows you to return complex data structures from within standard endings. Uh, later on in the series, we should have an, uh, we'll have an opportunity to address it further um, than how, how to actually set up and configure the tabular data item, as well as we'll show you some examples of how to, you know, using each one of these items and, you know, how they will happen. They're pretty simple stuff. Um, once you actually created your standard MDs, the next piece of the puzzle is actually registering your MDs within within coherence or within the MDs server. Um, and there are really four ways to go about doing it. Uh, the first way uh, is programmatically. So within your Java code somewhere, you want to be able to say, hey, let's time all this, this item set up and ready to go. So then you can go ahead and configure it. Uh, you can register it either with the uh, local MDs server that allows you to actually go, you find your inbeam server and actually do a register, giving it an object name. Or if you want the, the item to be used the coherence infrastructure, you can do so with the coherence registry. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the, the way these are registered, show you a couple, an example of how that happens later on. The third way, the, the other way is to use a configuration registration. Uh, so that's a mouthful. Um, which is allow coherence to actually register the MDs for you. Um, this allows you to go through and basically configure an XML file. It's a custom MBs.xml uh, configuration. It also provides the standard override capability within coherence. And it has several ways. And the, the, the standard MBs are normally done either through class registration, which is providing a class for the MBs or MBs or using a factory method to actually call and instantiate the MBN for you. Okay, so you've talked about, you know, very quickly, here's, here are the components of the standard MBN. We talked about how you actually register them. Uh, and I just wanted to throw out very quickly the, uh, you know, what not to do, how, how, how to avoid big mistakes within them. Uh, number one is you don't want to really do any significantly slow operations within the MBs, especially things that can cause race conditions or deadlocks, uh, i.e. synchronizations or I.O. And I kind of put the, of course, you knew this, but just wanted to give you a checklist of not what, what not to do. Um, try not to put large amounts of static or informational data in these items. Uh, one thing about the coherence, is that it will bring back an entire MBEAM. So if you have a remotely managed MBEAM and you need to, uh, you want to pull it back to the centralized managing server where your MBEAM server is running, it will bring back the entire MBEAM and all the data to the managed side every time you access any piece of data. So if you have a mixed MBEAM uh, where you have you know, statistics that are updating you know, frequently, and you have some configuration information that you want to be able to uh, bring into the uh, bring into the uh, MB as well, right? So, you know, your configuration or your setup, you know, slow-moving things, large strings, uh, things like that. Try to avoid putting those in the same MB. Uh, which is which is a which is one item. It also will reduce your overhead because you'll be looking at the uh, statistics more frequently than your actual configurations. Um, another problem we see, and this is sort of a walk the fine line between uh, optimization versus uh, completeness, which is making too many MBs. Um, each MB that is retrieved, you have to actually go and make a request across the, the network to retrieve it. And if you're pulling back all or using the same information, over and over, say, like you're always using, you know, all the cache information or all the service information from a node, you would probably want to bundle that information up and return it in one request. However, if your YouTube pattern is a situation where you'll be looking at one individual MB at a time, which most people really don't do, you might want to make more MBs. But as you go about it, making too many MBs will significantly retreat, increase your time. So 
Also, my disability pattern, don't over empty it. Um, they actually made this mistake in the coherence items when you start making, you know, cache times node endings, you can end up with hundreds of thousands of endings out there depending on the multiplication. Um, one of the items we discussed also is consider using composite data types. Uh, they will reduce your overhead. They will uh, increase the amount of data you can send back and forth. Um, and the last one is they avoid skewing of data. Uh, one of the things that happens within the uh, inbeam server is every attribute is a call. So when you're looking at data, if you're looking at a calculation like uh, the size of the attribute, the size of the cluster equals uh, the number of inserts minus the removes minus the evictions, right? So size equals that. And you wanted to do that audit. The, if those are in separate attributes, they will be skewed over time, and that audit will never be equal. It will always be off because they will be different periods of time for each one of the items. So by including, if you need to do a calculation like that, you would need to bundle those items up, synchronize them on the, the creation, which we talked about not really liking to do very much, but if you absolutely have to, you can do so. And then you would include those within a single attribute within a composite data type. Uh, by doing so, you significantly reduce the uh, you can reduce the overhead of transmission as well as get an atomic read of the data. Okay, so that is just the simple uh, what not to do. Um, and I'm running about right on time. Um, what are we going to talk about later? We'll talk about factory registration. Coherence platforms, notifications, some of the new features within the 3.6 module. Uh, we want to talk and show some uh, integration with RQView and how to consume custom endings. We'll talk more about time skew and ending data collection. And we'll talk more about some performance and overhead considerations. So we've started a few minutes late, and I do have about five minutes here. So I wanted to go out and show you um, some examples of kind of these first items that we talked about. Um, and here is an, what I basically came up with is in 3.6, uh, they didn't go about creating a uh, core MIDI, right? So they have over within the service, the coherence has quorum for customer service. And it will show you the attributes to say, you know, quorum status, which is this redistribute string thing. But what it didn't do for you is it didn't tell you what your actual settings were. So a good example of a quorum of a exposing custom uh, coherence information that wasn't exposed through the items is the, the quorum status. Um, and what I did is I actually added to this one, I added a notification capability, which allows you to actually go through and change set of thresholding. So it will allow they will generate notifications based on the actual quorum thresholds. So you'll notice I got a threshold setting that says, hey, you hit threshold seven, so theoretically, so the, the threshold will actually be reached and I will not be able to read versus setting it below. So this is one kind of MB we talked about, which is just extending coherence. Um, the other one we talked about was actually processing the actual stats, which is how, how are things running? And if you look, Here, I've actually written a custom MB that allows me to check and validate the performance of each one of my queries. So here I'm actually doing an equals filter on state, or I'm getting, you know, doing a query on state, and I've got the number of executions 
the nanos, the maximum nanos, how long it's been running, and what the service is, where did this, where did the little item come from. And you'll notice that we're using a tabular navigation to allow you to actually see the data show up for multiple different queries on the same, uh, on the same attribute. So, that is kind of a preview. We'll be talking about more on how do you actually go about coding these techniques uh, in the next parts of the series and giving you a feel for actually how to go out and create your own within coherence in the next version. So I think I am ready to, I think we can go ahead and open this up to uh, any questions at this point. So. Thank you so much, Everett. I'd like to invite the audience to submit any additional questions at this time by entering them into the chat panel and clicking Submit. If we're not able to get to all the questions during the live event, we'll be sure to follow, follow up with any unanswered questions via email. Okay, let's take a look here. Our first question is, uh, do you have any sample MBean code you can give us? Uh, the answer is yes, um, and I will be getting, we'll, we'll be going through the samples in the next uh, sequence, and I will be getting that out. We can either send it out before or we can send it out uh, after the next one. Okay. Um, great. Thank you very much, Everett. Our next question, uh, the data types you showed, Everett, were wrapper-like, like integer, or wrapper types like integer. Can you use primitive types like INT? Uh, the answer is yes um, for most of them. It, 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 will, uh, it will use the, the, the primitives as well. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, what is a quorum? Uh, the quorum information within coherence is a new feature for uh, 36, which allows uh, the c cluster to stop performing uh, features depending on the um, depending on the actual value. So if you look here, where we were looking at the quorum, the um, so what this one says is that the quorum number, we have a distributed quorum, read quorum, restore quorum, and write quorum. So what this basically says is this number is set to 1. So if my cluster size is bigger than 1, coherence will execute a redistribution of partitions. If it's smaller than that, coherence will stop performing redistributions and will uh, will just basically, you know, stop, will, will perform errors. So what it allows you to do is it will um, basically shuts down the cluster as soon as it hits a certain level. And the reason for this was to prevent um, catastrophic failures uh, for when, let's say you had a cluster, you... Uh, your data size you know is cannot fit in anything smaller than 10 nodes. As soon as you lost your 10th node, you wouldn't want to redistribute all the data because that would just continue to cause errors. So your ninth node would fall, your eighth, and then eventually the entire cluster would fall over. So what this basically allows you to do is prevent uh, catastrophic failure based on you know, sizing and the node, and the node items. So, that is what the quorum feature is all about. Excellent. Thanks, Everett. Uh, our next question is, what about java.util.concurrent.atomic types like at atomic long? I do not believe it uses those. I think you have to convert them to the actual long. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty certain it does not. Okay, that was our last question for today. Thank you very much for those questions. Uh, this webcast has been recorded, and we'll be, we will be emailing you a link to the recording within the next couple of days. If you are interested in the sample code, please send email to marie at sl.com. Please feel free to register for parts two and three of the series. De detailed information can be found on our website by clicking on the three-part developer webinar series graphic 
on the EdSol.com homepage. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day.